Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during this presentation today, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody to the August 5th edition of Crop Talk. And uh, this week, uh, we're going to be uh, going through a few topics. Uh, one that uh, came up was uh, a lot of uh, people are out in the fields now scouting for bugs and disease. And I figured it was also a good time while you're out in the field, should be checking for some of the other things that are going on. And one of them was uh, weeds and uh, what type of weeds are showing up in your field and maybe a little bit of talk about weed resistance, see how good your chemical uh, program worked for you this year and see if you might be having uh, some issues that are creeping up in your farm that uh, if you kind of uh, can identify them early on, you can uh, help control some of them. And then after that, uh, once again, we'll have the, the crop scouting panel and uh, we got uh, a good uh, good selection of questions that came in again this week. So uh, I'm going to uh, hopefully get them answered for everybody. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, do my update or a little bit of an update at the end today because I want to save enough time for all the, uh, the presentation and the, uh, and the questions. So to start with, uh, let's turn the screen over to Ingrid. Ingrid is... Farm Production Extension Specialist with Manitoba Ag, and she is uh, going to give us a talk on weed resistance. Okay, Laurie, good to go? You bet. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, Lionel asked me to talk a bit about herbicide-resistant weeds, and certainly a never-ending never story. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit about what to look for and what are some of the newer, newer herbicide resistant weed concerns. Um, one thing, as, as um, Lionel mentioned, people are out scouting looking for diseases and, and uh, insects and that. And certainly if harvest hasn't started for you, it probably will pretty soon. I noticed uh, there's some peas off here and I saw some wheat that was swathed last night, so it's getting going. Um, so some of you will be having a look for pre-harvest glyphosate timing. Some might be looking at desiccant timing. So that is a great time to be having a look for any unusual things with the weed picture. You want to take time to see what's out there. So the reason that, uh, I've got to find my mouse here, um, reason that, uh, we talk about it is because it is becoming much more of a problem. I first started doing weed resistance workshops back in November 2011 and these are the kinds of numbers that we were seeing. 115 broadleaf species worldwide, 85 grass species and 51 in Canada. I looked at the numbers yesterday and this is the increase so up to 514 with 152 broadleafs and 110 grasses and resistant herbicide resistant weeds are reported in 93 country, 93 crops in 70 countries. And just by the nature of how these things are reported, we know that that is underreported. So in Manitoba or in Canada, we're up to 68 plus. So that was a jump from 51. Now, uh, one thing to note, if you are doing any background research on some of this stuff, the numbers will never match. Um, and part of it is the way it's reported. Uh, there have to be confirmed uh, cases before they can be entered in that weedscience.org database, and that's kind of the, the, the top reporting um, um, reference for herbicide resistance. But the, the point to remember is that uh, we have a lot of the resistance cases in Canada. We're running neck and neck with Ontario. We first started seeing them in 1988, and that's where we were more like, um, uh, you probably noted that uh, there were more broadleaf numbers worldwide, where in Manitoba and, and Western Canada, we have, have generally had a 
a big focus on grass species until fairly recently. But one of the first ones that showed up was kochia that was resistant to group two way back in 1998. And the same year, uh, green foxtail to group three, the edges, trifluralin, that type of thing. And uh, 1990 was when we really got going with group one wild oat resistance. So, so we've got a pretty long list. And as I said, not everything has made it to the official reporting. So there are likely more than what I've got listed here. So there is a survey that is also taken to get a, a background on what's going on in Manitoba with herbicide resistance. And so in 2016, the last survey, 68% of the fields that were looked at did have a herbicide resistant weed of some sort. So that's has certainly been on the increase since um, 48% in 2008, for instance. So uh, we're going in the wrong direction. So again, in 2016, you can see here that our big list is with the, the grassy weeds. And while our focus has always been on wild oats primarily, green foxtail also has some problems. Yellow foxtail, group one, group two, and then group one and two. And unfortunately, barnyard grass is showing up as well to group two. And um, we haven't even considered that a weed for all that many years, so uh, kind of concerning that it's up on the list. These have been the broadleaf weeds that we have been um, finding in those surveys and are confirmed, and group two seems to be uh, the big concern with these particular broadleafs, but we do certainly have more than that. So going back to wild oat, the main concern for us, we have uh, quite a number of different resistance issues. And unfortunately, in Manitoba only, we have uh, a wild oat that's resistant to 1 and 2 and 8 and 14 and 15. So that's a pretty scary, um, scary thought to be dealing with that level of resistance. So, so with those wild oats, what's left? We've got the group threes, the edges and trefflands, uh, glufosinate, the liberty in canola, or glyphosate. And the reason that I highlighted glyphosate is it's only a matter of time before we have um, glyphosate resistant wild oats as well. So we can't be looking that, at that always as our main means of controlling some of these issues. Okay, so weed resistance, what to look for. Like I said before, scouting is really important. Uh, you do need time to check take the time to check and um, and I know that we're all a, a little bit guilty of this. Um, you know, sometimes we keep an eye out when we're traveling and we'll see something in a field. Uh, as I'll show you a little bit later on, you do get, can get some surprises that way, whether good or bad, there's still surprises. Um, when you are out scouting, you wanna be looking for things that are out of the, the ordinary, whether it's, new patches of weeds or larger patches of weeds. When you are scouting, you have to make sure that you're considering what has been going on with the weather, because that can be part of the issue, whether um, a herbicide resistant weed is showing up or there's been some issues with performance of your herbicide based on weather or growing conditions. The one that I think about this year We've had a lot of thin stands because it was so cold and dry in most places to start with and stay dry for a long time. So there wasn't a whole lot of weed pressure early on. Sometimes there wasn't an application made or it was delayed as late as possible. And we still had rain later on that caused some weeds to germinate. And because some of the stands were thin, um, probably had um, more opportunity for some of those weeds to grow and be a concern. So weather does become very important. Uh, another example would be lambs quarters this year. It has become more of an issue, not necessarily uh, because of Roundup. Um, and there hasn't been any confirmed uh, Roundup or glyphosate resistant lambs quarters. But certainly in a year like this where you have dry conditions, plants always are trying to take care of themselves, and you might find uh, 
thick cuticles on some of them, waxy layers, and lamb's quarters is certainly one of those. And there has been some issues with um, uh, with degree of control with that. So something else to keep in mind. Um, oddball patches, especially in the same spot for more than one year. And again, you know, when it's just a small patch, we think, oh, that's probably not going to be an issue. But do you want to keep an eye on some of those things, especially if they're especially if they're um, plants that are looking a little bit unusual or something new to you. Field history, of course, becomes very important. You absolutely need to keep track of all the herbicides going onto that field. So this year, one thing that we are seeing a fair bit of is wild oats in, um, in barley. Um, Lionel and I have both been doing disease surveys in barley, so we're spotting spotting some of the wild oats. Again, this could be because of the thin stand um, or later germinating ones, but as you can see, here's a good crop of, of uh, green wild oats. You can see that there's patches. That would definitely be something to keep an eye on. And this is where field history really becomes important, not just from the point of view of herbicides, but also on what you're seeing. Uh, one thing um, I think it's really important to note if you are depending on, on an agronomist to do your scouting for you, it's really important to develop a relationship either with a single agronomist or um, a single retail so that there's discussion between people who are going out scouting so they can kind of keep track of what's going on in your, on your field. And of course, you want to be out there double checking as well. Um, Lots of things going on out there, and and certainly your um, your history with the field is going to be the the prime importance of, uh, of keeping track of things. So here's another shot of wild oats and barley. Um, I don't know necessarily that this field this field may not have been sprayed, but if it was, then I would assume that this is a high degree of of herbicide resistance because it wouldn't have been touched by herbicide. In this field here, you can see some of both. Some have already shelled out, some are still green. Um, so in, in this case, it's not a huge patch. That may be something that you'd want to look if it's, if it's just getting started in your field rather than allowing seeds to, to set and um, risk further spread over the field. Maybe you want to take care of it right away. Here, wild, oat in, in, uh, wild oats and wheat, uh, maybe a little bit easier to, to deal with. Uh, wouldn't be all that hard to, to, um, to mow up that patch and deal with it right away if you figure that it is resistance. One thing in looking at some of these grasses and whether or not they are green at this time or they are, well, you can't really tell with the ones that have shelled out, but the ones certainly that are green, have a look at the base of the plant and see what's going on there. If you can see that there are some dead leaves and then regrowth um, from the base, that may be one of your first signs other than than seeing the patch, that may be one of your first signs that there is some resistance. So maybe the herbicide partly took care of the weed, but there was still enough to, for um, the plant to go through and resistance could be one of those reasons. So again, wild oats and wheat. Here's another one, importance of keeping track of what's going on in your field, wild oats in soybeans. They're fairly green, so you might think that this would be um, an issue with glyphosate resistance, certainly could be. Uh, so something you wanna keep an eye on. Um, I guess the other thing is to know, again, what's going on in the field. You can see in, in this area that all the wild oats seem to be in the tracks. So likely had something to do with wet conditions at spring or even at seeding and you've got some compaction um, and stuff sitting in the tracks. But again, these are smaller areas, certainly a time when you can take care of them fairly readily. I talked a little bit earlier about um, um, looking for plants that are affected and dying and kochia is 
a great example of that. You can see that there is damaged tissue here and you can see very oddball growth. So the, the glyphosate in this case did affect the kochia, but it managed to grow through. So um, this is earlier on, of course, than what you would be seeing at this time of year. But uh, keep in mind that you want to be looking for plants that aren't completely killed and those are of prime concern to you in figuring out if you do have resistance problems. Here are some classic ones, good control with some of them, other ones have completely come through. Here you've knocked out the growing point and you can see um, little kochia um, plants uh, growing out of the stems because you've knocked out the, the apical dominance. And odd looking plants. You really need to keep an eye out for odd looking plants. And these kochia plants are tall and skinny, e even though it's not a huge um, amount of competition from this crop with the wide row. So keep an eye out for some of those oddballs as well. I'm just gonna flip through here. So uh, with kochia in particular, there's lots of variability. So this one can be a little bit deceptive. You might think that you've got good control or maybe just, um, you know, maybe there's a, just been a little bit of an issue because you can see this color change. Um, but then when you've got a nice green, healthy looking plant, there's something going on there. In this particular field, this was um, a new field to the grower. He, he sprayed, um, sprayed his glyphosate twice. Um, still there was kochia coming through. He did go on again a third time, unfortunately not with anything else added into the mix. So he had a fair bit of escapes. You can see all kinds of different kochia plants in this shot. Some are dead, some are pale green, but there's enough that are a nice healthy looking green. And the scary thing here is besides seed spread within the field, when those uh, kochia plants break off and roll, then you've got that, um, that uh, glyphosate resistant kochia spreading for as far as those plants roll. Here again, even at, um, at um, crop maturity, you can see the remnants of plants that may be affected. The reason I wanted to include this slide is because of the lamb's quarters. You can see that, that they are growing fairly healthily too. Uh, there's some salinity in this patch, so, so herbicides aren't the whole story here. But I mentioned earlier about the waxy cuticle. Driving by this field, you would just immediately assume that it was um, glyphosate resistance. However, looking closer, it's all lamb's quarters. This field was sprayed twice with a group four um, because they initially thought it was um, kochia. They thought it must be group four resistant kochia, which would also be resistant to group two and, and glyphosate group nine. In this case, we're not sure whether it was because of poor conditions for uh, uptake of the herbicides at time of spraying with that waxy cuticle. Um, so there can be a number of different things going on and it's important to keep track of, of what conditions were like at spraying as well as what you were spraying. So again, we're underreported in kochia. These maps show every, every RM that um, glyphosate resistant kochia has been confirmed. The important thing to note here, it's only samples that have gone through the PSI lab. So we know that there's a whole lot more resistant kochia than this. The point I wanted to show here is that it's increasing. And I believe that they are thinking that 59% of the kochia is now glyphosate resistant in Manitoba. We assume it's all group two resistant. A, a big one that's new to us or quite new to us is water hemp, first found in the RM of Taché in 2017, also found in the RM of Rhineland, and it continues to spread. Uh, these are the confirmed RMs where it has been found. And again, um, 
unless it's confirmed, it doesn't make it onto the map. So there's a good chance that we're seeing it in other areas as well. This one is causing us a lot of grief because early on, it's very easy to, um, to misidentify as redroot pigweed. So that's why I wanted to show you some of these smaller plants. The thing about the redroot pigweed is it has hairs where the water hemp doesn't. So that may be a thing that can help you out um, in identifying. Here's a bit of a close up on the hairs on the stem. The other thing is the water hemp is quite a glossy green, it's unlike the, you know, there's little hairs on the redroot pigweed. So another thing to look for. This is a field of corn in eastern Manitoba. You can see a whole lot of water hemp in the background there. Um, the thing to note here is this isn't just from one, this isn't the first year that water hemp has been in this field. Uh, so when you see the degree of, of how uh, the population in this field, um, it certainly would have been a whole lot easier to manage if you could have dealt with it in a smaller spot. I guess the other thing that, that comes into play here is that it's considered a, a, a tier one noxious weed. And so by nature of our Noxious Weed Act, you are actually required to destroy it. So again, something you wanna keep an eye on and you can see how this stuff is just continuing to grow. Um, Again, at maturity, there's a lot of difference between the flowers. The one on the left is red root pigweed. The one on the right is water hemp. And when you get to this stage of crop maturity, you can see that there's a huge amount of variability with those plants. Lots of difference in colors. With water hemp, they have both male and female flowers. So it's only the female flowers that have viable seed. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out here is this was down in North Dakota the first time that I had ever seen water hemp. And to be honest, when I first looked at it, I thought it was biennial wormwood, looking at it from a distance. That's what we're what we were used to in Manitoba. Those are the kinds of things we're seeing poking above the crop. But once you get up close, then you can see see it for what it really is. In this particular circumstance, it was a really small area, so certainly you could even go in there and pull up those plants and take care of it right off the hop. Again, just showing some of the color differences. Tiny little seeds, and as you might guess by its name, um, it moves easily with water, and so um, as, along with other means of spread, whether it's tillage or seed movement within the field water, certainly gonna be part of the story. A few other things to keep an eye out for. Um, this is another glyphosate resistant weed, um, giant ragweed. It's being found in Eastern Manitoba again. The story there is um, many successive applications of glyphosate. Um, um, numerous, numerous soybean crops in a row. And certainly in this case, al although there are other areas that have uh, glyphosate resistant giant ragweed, in this case, it is almost certain that it was selection pressure. All the ragweeds have this type of flower. So this is something that you can look for for identification. With the giant ragweed, the, the leaves are basically three lobed. This one is a little bit different, but basically three lobed is what you're looking for to differentiate between it and the false ragweed. You can see here, here's the three lobes. Um, in this field, it's a sunflower field, and I was looking straight up to catch the top of those plants. They can grow to be 13 feet high, so certainly competitive and can be very competitive in a row crop. Just another shot. Uh, this one is common ragweed, much shorter, um, certainly a uh, concern in eastern Canada and, and one we expect to have here at some point. So far we've been lucky because if any has shown up, we have enough wheat in our rotations that usually there's a group four like a 2,4-D or or a, a product like that being sprayed and generally control is pretty good with those products. Um, it stays quite small, although it ha does have those traditional um, ragweed type flowers. 
you can easily, from a distance, easily think that this might be a small kochia plant. This one we don't have yet. We're kind of expecting that we'll see it at some point. Plant Canada fleabane that's resistant to glyphosate. These plants here were actually sprayed again three times with the equivalent of uh, a liter each time. They did get knocked back, but you can see these different spots along the plant where they stalled, didn't die, and kept on regrowing. So what's happened in this field is just um, great selection pressure for um, having um, Canada flea bane that is very tolerant of glyphosate. Uh, changing track a little bit, yellow foxtail. This one is being uh, becoming much more common. We had kind of ignored it for a long time because green foxtail was the key weed. Uh, they are quite different at uh, heading time, so easy to spot. And these yellow hairs are the are the reason that the yellow foxtail gets its name. Earlier on, they look identical, except the yellow foxtail has long hairs on the leaf blade. Why are we seeing more of it? It does really well in wide rows, and there's so many more crops grown in Manitoba now in wide rows, so we get shifts in populations because of that. And, and group one and a group two, and then group one and group two together is what we are dealing with currently. There's a closer shot of the, the uh, yellow fox tail. Uh, I see that my time is getting on here, so I think I will probably speed through some of this. Uh, but just a couple of points is remember that anything you can do to deal with these weeds early on will make life much easier for you as time goes on. Uh, water hemp in particular isn't easy to manage and there will be multiple resistance over time. It's not that um, there's a chance of it, it will, because that's what is going on um, in North America. And it doesn't take very long for those plants to have an issue with resistance. If you do find water hemp in your field, you wanna make sure to get on it as soon as possible. If they don't have mature seed, uh, you need to cut them off below the soil surface, and burn or compost. The reason for that is if you just let them to lie on the ground, they and if you have enough moisture, they'll actually regerminate along the stalk amazingly. So you do have to really keep on top of that. And um, you want to avoid harvesting at spots with water hemp and make so you're not spreading seed and make sure that you're cleaning your equipment before you move on to another field. So We've had these herbicide resistance issues around for years and we're still using herbicides, so that's good. Are we willing victims of taking the thinking out of weed control? And really that's in reference to, um, you know, I hate to pick on anybody, but really if, if you've gone to that Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready soybean rotation, that is not a rotation. That is heading for a train wreck. You have to be looking at um, diversity. We can't say often enough that that is key. So I'll just breeze through some of the rest of these. Um, solutions to weed resistance can't emphasize enough how important that scouting is. Certainly after each application and through the season and looking to see if there's any differences in how the herbicides are affecting those plants like we referred to or like I referred to earlier with the kochia as an example. Um, this is uh, one of those situations I think I can get one more year out of glyphosate well unless you're taking care of this patch and getting every every single plant of water hemp out you are not getting uh, another year you're just increasing your risk. So if you don't already have herbicide resistance and the chances that you don't have it are slim to none, it will definitely be a problem for you. And we don't have any magic bullet herbicides that are going to come along and rescue us. It's all going to be about management, good management, diversity, um, changing up things as much as possible and keeping an eye and dealing with small patches before they could become big issues. 
And Lionel, I think I've taken lots of time, so we'll wrap it up there. Okay, Ingrid, uh, that was uh, that was great. Uh, I do have some questions for you if uh, we can handle them right now. Um, how can you determine if wild oats are escapes or just late emergers? That is a problem. And and that's the importance of scouting is to, you know, to be out there regularly to see what's going on. That is really the only way you can identify it. Unless you have, like I mentioned, if you have some, um, some dead plants in, in the area where the patch is, if you see some dead plants or if you see leaves that have uh, been affected and then there's new growth coming from the base of that, um, that plant, that would be the first tip off for, for resistance. But, but scouting becomes key there because as time goes on, you know how it is, you have a dead leaf and it, it degrades away so you no longer know what the true story on that that plant is so scouting key okay um there's two more here um when is a good time to sample uh for resistance and where would you send samples okay um, right now, there's not a lot of options. If you have kochia that you suspect might be resistant to glyphosate and you want to confirm that, um, the, the PSI lab can do PCR testing, so that's on live green tissue. And um, so that is the easiest one to get tested. Unfortunately, that's really the only one that we have access to. For every other weed issue that we have, it means letting the plants go to seed and saving that seed. Um, as far as I know, the key researcher right now is Charles Geddes with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Uh, so for instance, if you had wild oats that you thought might be a concern, you'd want to collect those plants that's, and you need quite a large sample of seed. You want to make sure that they're dried properly um, so that you don't get any mold or degrading that way because those seeds won't germinate. And it, they have to go through quite a period of waiting. So actually um, anybody who's doing testing on those, they I believe they go into a freezer before they get um, uh, grown out and tested. Uh, I, I should say there that AgQuest does them. I don't know what the fees are, but you certainly can send them there. For some of these newer issues, uh, Charles Geddes would be the one to send to, but really you have to collect mature seed. Um, a couple of cautions, kosha you can certainly collect seed from. I'm interested in seeing some of the that lamb's quarters um, waiting for that seed to mature and um, again drying is really important um, and making sure that it is mature before you pick it. Um, the other one, oh the ragweeds, those ones are tougher and if you notice on the list that I had there isn't any ragweed on that list. It is really hard to get ragweed to germinate in, um, in a lab. So that is definitely um, a problem, but considering that the field situations we've seen, we, you know, we don't really need to confirm that it's resistant. But so there's a few avenues, and probably the easiest route is if if, uh, if a grower wants to um, follow up on some of this is to give one of us a call and just walk through the steps that they need to take and then the contacts. So there is a fee for service one, like through AgQuest and I think a couple of others. And then the, the PCR test for the kochia, um, every grower uh, gets one free test a year. And then for those newer and oddball ones, it would be through Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Great, good answer there. Um, another one here, um, how do rates 
effect resistance. Example, uh, several different rates of glyphosate on canola. Should we always be using the, the high rate? Yeah, that's one thing that it's kind of been a struggle because earlier on we, you know, everybody looked at putting on lower rates when you had low weed populations and excellent growing conditions. But we know now that there's a higher risk for selection pressure with that kind of, of, um, of um, uh, weed control measures. So, so really the full rates at the best timing, best growing conditions possible, that really is the way to go. If we're going at cut rates, we are taking the chance of selecting for weeds that have some degree of resistance already. The, in, in some of those cases, a low rate of resistance may be taken care of by a full rate, so we don't want to miss out on that opportunity. Okay, great. And, uh, and one comment here. Uh, uh, interesting talk. Just a note that weeds are a good host for plant parasitic nematodes and acting as a potential host. Support multiplication of nematodes that later can spread to crops. Well, no an example is Canada thistle in Manitoba for stem nematode and peas. Yeah. And here's here's an aside that I found interesting. I found a, a gall on Canada thistle the other day that John Gabalowski tells me has actually been released as a biocontrol of Canada thistle. So there's all kinds of things going on in plants that we know little or nothing about. And uh, there's much more in the bigger picture than we realize. Great, well, thanks a lot, Ingrid. That was a lot of really good information. And uh, Laurie, if uh, you could turn the screen back to me, we could get into our uh, panel and get into some more questions. Okay, so there's the members of our panel. And again, there's the uh, email address that uh, you can send your questions to and uh, we'll try to get them answered for you. So uh, first question today is, uh, uh, sent this picture of uh, purple, color, purple coloring on the pods of canola and was wondering what is causing this. They were wondering if it was running out of sulfur. Um, I think I'm gonna send this to Dane and David and see if they, uh, what they have to comment on. Thanks, Lionel. Um, well, purpling is certainly a symptom of sulfur deficiency. Generally, we're gonna see that on the crop earlier in the season. And um, we're gonna see the smaller stunted leaves, usually with a waterlogged soil or something like that. Uh, this late in the season, um, you may notice a sulfur deficiency on petals where you're seeing a very pale yellow flower, not a truly bright yellow uh, canola. But on the pods themselves, this is indicative of sunburn. Uh, just like uh, sunburn on your skin being out in the high UV rays for too long, um, the canola that's directly positioned towards the sun, you can see it's purple on one side of the pod and not on the other. That's just a, a foliar tissue uh, burn on the canola plant. It's a sunburn, simple as that, and it won't be causing yield loss or anything like that mm -hmm. nature, but it's that causing that cuticle to just uh, give that uh, distinctive purple coloration. Okay, good, and we'll go on to the next one then. This one is for John Hurd and, and Marla, I guess. Uh, when is the best time to start soil sampling in the fall? Um, can you go too early? And as we talked earlier on, we do have some winter wheat and uh, fall rye that's coming off. Uh, and we also got some people thinking about planting winter wheat and fall rye. So uh, good question for you guys to, to help us out with. Okay, well, I'll take a crack at it first because uh, we all know that uh, on the, the stone tablets, it was chiseled that uh, thou shalt not uh, start soil sampling until the soils cool to five degrees C. And that always used to be the guidelines. And um, so, uh, but that there, there, there's encumbrances with that. So several years ago, I, I know Dave France in North Dakota and in 1999, 2000, I looked at this and we found that following cereals, there was not much change in uh, 
soil nitrate levels if you sample. That's not the case for peas or canola. There, there can still be some accumulation, but they tend to be pretty stable after uh, cereals. So uh, I did eight locations and then beginning of September it was 49 pounds of nitrate in and the uh, early November it was 44 pounds and in spring it was 51 pounds across those sites. So it was pretty stable. So if you're following cereal fields, now can be a time to go. And uh, there's a, a number of reasons that are suggested advantages. One is you're more likely to get your sampling done. You can uh, get service providers out there now. They have more time. Uh, you get your analysis in time to do your fall fertilization uh, orders and prescriptions and get it applied. Uh, very important is at least you get it done before tillage. And if we're sampling undisturbed soil, then we get true depth separation of that zero to six and six to 24. Uh, and uh, we avoid volunteer crop regrowth that takes up and hides nitrogen from a, a further test. And um, the other one is I got to mention from Don Flayton, he always has been an advocate of using the nitrate test as an auditing tool of how did I do in fertilizing that crop. And uh, Amy Maje and Don did the studies a few years ago and found a few benchmark values. I think a, a good level to have on a field is somewhere between 20 to 40 pounds of nitrate in means maybe did a, a satisfactory job of hitting the target when they got up to 55 pounds residual in it meant that they'd supplied more nitrogen than uh, was required for optimum yield so you can with time you can use that information uh, to um, uh, kind of assess whether I did a good job of, of meeting the, the yield potential in the field. I got some other notes, but Marla, you better say your piece if you have some comments also. No, you covered that, John. Okay, well, okay, well, the other part of the story is it doesn't always work. Like last year, people did sampling early, got the job done, and then we got, you know, in some cases, up to nine inches of rain. Water moves nitrogen, and so, Sometimes we get occasions uh, where we will have uh, uh, Mother Nature can change those levels. So in some cases, a bit of retesting might be required for nitrogen only. And the other is um, one of our sites that we studied had very aggressive fall tillage uh, two times over in the fall. It was a high organic matter soil. And there, you know, doing that fall summer fallowing, produced a bit more nitrogen. Wasn't due to the cereal crop, just due to aggressive uh, fall tillage. So if you're doing some of these other things, you may change or uh, uh, alter that nitrate level somewhat. That's all I have to say about that, Lionel. Okay, well, I'm gonna just add a, or ask a, a follow-up to this, uh, the producer's question. Um, Last year, actually, I think I've seen it a couple times where uh, guys were actually going in between the canola swaths and and soil sampling for guys, especially that wanted to plant winter wheat. Um, you had mentioned that canola and peas might not be great. Um, any more comments to that? Uh, j j just that they're more likely to see a bit more elevation in uh, nitrate level as the fall progresses. Um, uh, some of their carbon and nitrogen ratio is not as high as it is for cereals. Uh, so we'd expect certainly with the peas that we can gain some nitrogen in the fall. Um, so, but you know, what options do you have for winter wheat? You got to get it sampled before you put the seed in the ground. So yeah, go to it. Okay, good, thanks John. Uh, Dennis Lang, uh, some spotting showing up on both sides of the soybean leaves and uh, a lot of them were the upper leaves. Um, any comments on that? And uh, I think you have some slides. So, Laurie, I think we'll need to give the screen to Dennis. Yes, thanks, Lionel. I'll just wait for the screen to come up here. Okay. Um, we are seeing uh, the, the image that you see uh, on the uh, 
on the right here, uh, or on the left here, I should say, uh, we are seeing some bacterial blight in the canopy right this year. Um, a little different this year. Uh, sometimes we are seeing typically only in the upper canopy, but we're also seeing it down into the mid canopy. Um, so the image you see on the left here, you'll see this necrotic tissue in the center and this yellow halo around it. Usually with bacterial blight, uh, it shows up, you know, within 10 days or so, 10 to 14 days after some type of weather event, and it kind of progresses. If, and if you look in the bottom kind of left corner here, uh, one way you can kind of tell if it's, uh, you know, uh, bacterial blight is when you start to see this leaf tearing. That means that necrotic tissue has kind of fallen out, and that's a kind of a good indicator. Wow. A lot of times you'll see that uh, bacterial blight in the uh, upper or mid canopy. Um, what you can also see is something like uh, the image you see on the right here. And uh, here, this is more Satoria brown spot. You can see that, whoops, you can, you can see the differences here uh, between the type of lesions that you see here. Uh, these lesions really co coalesce. Um, and with Septoria brown spot, that you'll see typically in the lower canopy. Now this year being, um, we've had good moisture early on, but now we're starting to dry off and uh, ground gets, is dry in some, in some regions. Um, the Septoria is still gonna be present, but we might not see, when we do our disease ratings here in the next week or so, we might not see as much of it, um, mainly because some of these leaves are maybe dropping off, the lower leaves dropping off. But, um, the Satoria brown spot, there is fungicide options available for it, but typically it's not economical. And uh, uh, but for bacterial blight, there are no economical uh, or there are no products you can spray on it because it is a bacteria. So um, a couple other things I just kind of wanted to uh, touch on a little bit uh, since I'm kind of rolling in it right now. Anyways, um, one of the questions that Lionel had posed to me here uh, yesterday uh, is uh, the how long do soybeans grow till or when did they stop? Right now, we're anywhere between the R3 growth stage here, uh, where you see the beginning potting uh, uh, staging, all the way up to R5, and in some cases, we're pushing into R6. So for R5, uh, if you look at the four uppermost nodes on the main stem, and you open that uh, pot up, you'll see uh, a seed that's about an eighth of an inch long. So that would be typically your R5 growth stage. Uh, R6, typically, you will see um, full seeds at the top, uh, in the top four nodes. And as far as the staging goes, or as far as you know, how, when they meet, meet the max, maximum height, typically when you get between R5 and R6, so between those stages is when you'd see the maximum number of height, maximum number of nodes, and, and maximum number of leaf area. So uh, we're probably right now at the, at the top end of where those plants are gonna grow to for, uh, for anything that's in the R5 to R6 growth stage. And uh, just one other slide I'll just throw in here. Uh, just to keep your eyes open for any phytophthora root rot uh, that you may see. Um, yeah, this is a, a good time to really be watching for it. In this particular plant here, you'll see the, here the blackening of the, uh, of the plant from the lower, from the roots up. Uh, it kind of kills the plants from the base up and the leaves kind of cling on to the uh, plant. They don't drop off. And um, in this case here, uh, this is from a stressed area from a plant or from a field, I should say. And it's something that you would see uh, we're starting to see a little bit of right now. So that's what I had for my slides here, Lionel. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Dennis. And if Laurie, if you can give the screen back. Okay, um, I'm going to just, this is the, the one question that I had for Dennis regarding how tall there are these soybeans gonna get. Uh, field I was in yesterday was uh, still four feet, at least four feet tall. And on the top, we were still seeing uh, uh, flowers and just small pods yet. And the farmer was saying, is this thing gonna get to five or six feet tall? And so Dennis, just the last last question to it, how tall have you seen soybeans grow in your your uh, history? Um, well, I guess the, the one thing, it, it, it is a little bit interesting. Uh, the early to mid-season varieties typically don't get as tall. Um, I, I'm fortunate to live in, in southern Manitoba, and, and sometimes on my way home, I can take the border road and uh, drive along the U.S.-Canada border road, and on one side of the, one side of the field, uh, I can see, or one side of the U.S., on the U.S. side, I can see soybean plants that are four and a half to five feet tall, um, whereas the varieties on this side, I, I never see them get that tall. Sometimes you'll see them kind of waist height. Uh, on me. 
Um, different varieties, different genetics. Uh, I've found some of the U.S. varieties, longer season varieties, typically get a little taller. But you know, um, typically when you're in that four and a half feet, that's 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 about the max that you'll see them. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, so next question uh, is going to go to Dane and David. And again, uh, doing some canola surveys and seeing some black spots showing up on the canola. If you guys can give your, uh, I guess, uh, answer to what uh, what this is that's showing up. Do you want me to take it, Dane? That's Alternaria pod spot, um, which is an organism that. Uh, shows up or a disease that shows up late in the season it's usually not going to affect uh, seed quality however if it's severe it can um, we are collecting pods in our general survey of uh, canola and that is to look for a thing known as bacterial pod spot we believe we don't have it in Canada but uh, just to prove it to our trading partners, we are collecting samples and sending them to a, a lab in Ontario. Um, on the lower, on the leaf there, Lionel's pointing out, I think, a symptom of alternaria on the low, one of the, that must be a mid-story leaf by its shape. But yeah, there's often a halo around the spot. Otherwise, it's a, a black spot, may or may not have concentric rings, no visible sporulation, really. It's okay. never a disease that you would have to uh, control with a fungicide. That's all I got, I think. Okay, good, thanks, guys. Uh, next one. Uh... Seeing this in both uh, some sunflowers and soybeans, uh, John Gavlowski, I uh, sent this to you, and uh, you could. I think we have, you've got a couple slides too. So, Lori, if you could pass the screen over to John. Okay, cool. So you guys can see my screen, can you? You bet. Okay, so yeah, this is thistle caterpillar. And so to begin with, this little caterpillar, it's the, the larva of a butterfly called Painted Lady Butterfly. And they don't overwinter here. They purposely migrate uh, north, same as Monarch. It's a purposeful migration. And uh, what we get here really depends on what populations were like to the south where they overwinter, uh, which is generally regions like um, California, Arizona, Mexico, those regions. Uh, last year, they migrated in in really large numbers, one of the bigger migrations we've seen. So there was quite a bit of concern in the soybeans. And last year, that was compounded with dry conditions where the soybeans were having trouble compensating for defoliation. So, and usually it takes the two things, um, a lot of thistle caterpillars plus other stresses for it to really be an economic issue. If the plants are growing well, usually they can overcome the damage. Now, uh, soybeans and sunflowers, even though they will feed on them, aren't their favorite foods. Thistles are really their favorite food. So when there's a lot of them around, usually you notice them first on the thistles. And I've actually had people in the past ask me, is there a way we can rear these things here and release them because they noticed the effect they were having on the thistles. But of course, people growing soybeans might not care for that too much. Um, but as mentioned, they will feed on crops like soybeans, sunflowers, occasionally canola, but not often. The problem is they're so highly visible. If you have even, say, one every five to ten plants, it looks bad when you walk into the field. It's probably not economical, but because they're a large caterpillar at the top of the plants, and they do make a, um, a webbing, and their feces is often laid in this webbing, it is very visible, so it can get things uh, or get people quite concerned. But the reality is it takes a lot of defoliation, especially in uh, soybeans and sunflowers, for things to become economical. And there are thresholds, generalized defoliation thresholds that are developed for soybeans. Now, these were developed more by people doing 
artificial damage to plants and seeing how the plants responded. And we tend to use these thresholds for both thistle caterpillar and grasshoppers and green clover worm and pretty much anything that defoliates soybeans. This um, one at the top here uh, for the pre-bloom growth stages, uh, I have seen people raise that to 40%, um, which really looks bad. Here on the chart, this is what 30% looks like, and you would have to have that throughout your canopy, not just on the upper leaves, um, for it to be really economical. So the bottom line is in the vegetative stages, it's very rare to get that kind of defoliation, and soybeans can compensate well for minor defoliation. When you get into the potting stages, um, the, from first bloom until the pods are filling, we lower the threshold to about 20%. So uh, the, the middle uh, row, the right leaf, that's 20%. That's roughly what you'd be looking at on average for defoliation um, for insecticide to be economical. And at those levels of defoliation, you're probably looking at about a 3 to 7% yield loss. So you can use that math to try to figure out the economics. Um, thistle caterpillar really doesn't feed on pods much. Uh, the third part to this threshold, people did d develop a threshold for if they're feeding directly on pods, if roughly 10% of pods have feeding, then you would treat the field. But again, thistle caterpillar, keep an eye on things, but if there's lush green vegetation, they probably won't feed on the pods. And the reason that we um, have such high thresholds in soybeans is soybeans are really good at compensating for defoliation. They typically produce excess leaves to begin with. Um, if there is defoliation happening, they will start retaining older leaves, which allows them to maintain a high level of photosynthesis. And if again, if there's heavy defoliation, they can usually fill some of the gaps by producing additional growth and branching on the plants. So there's ways that soybeans uh, can compensate quite well for uh, low and moderate levels of defoliation. So the bottom line message is uh, thistle caterpillar, highly visible, usually not highly economical because soybeans um, can compensate very well for low to moderate levels of defoliation. So that's all I had on that. Okay, thanks, John. That was good. Uh, question for John and Marla. Uh, producers' plans for this fall is to broadcast this phosphate on the field he's plan was planning on sowing soybeans next year. Um, he was just wondering if this is something he should look at doing. Is it something that, uh, or is he wasting some of his money on doing this? Well, uh, I'll take my stab at it and. Um... Uh, I'll let me, Aunt Marla can talk about the environmental implications, maybe. So, anyways, for, for agronomically, uh, you know, all the studies we did show that the, the soybeans just don't give a tinker's damn whether they're getting their phosphorus from fertilizer or the soil reserves. So, soil reserves are a very good place for us to bank phosphorus, and the soybeans seem to do quite well on it. Uh, this is one way to bank phosphorus in the soil, um, but for every other crop we grow other than soybeans, it's not the best way. Um, uh, all other crops uh, tend to respond much better to banded phosphorus, and the reason is that when we broadcast phosphorus, it's intimate with the, 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 the soil and rather reverts quickly from soluble forms to insoluble soil test phosphorus. Uh, so uh, other crops that we might have, like cereals or canola, uh, would not do as well if we were broadcasting. And the longer we leave it, the sooner we broadcast it, the longer it has to revert to this uh, uh, non-soluble uh, form in the soil. Uh, I guess that's a good thing if you're not going to incorporate it, at least it's going to be more stable and not run off as soluble phosphorus. Uh, but other than for soybeans, um, it's not really the best way to place it. And an example of that right in your area, uh, Lionel, is some of the really neat work that Adam Gurr has been doing. And he has been uh, fall banding 
some you know mega rates of phosphorus in order to elevate his soil test levels and he's seen some spectacular yield increases that we did not expect to see in wheat and canola um, and i doubt that he would have seen that if it had been broadcast but because those bands are there those bands are intact not being disturbed in a zero till system those highly enriched uh, subsurface bands are 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 doing something um, special out there in, in in creating some real yield response but the bottom line for me is yep so soybeans don't care so uh you can go to it but uh the other crops in your rotation that they'd prefer that stuff to be banded marla are there any problems with broadcasting phosphorus and leaving it on the surface in the fall well yeah i i'm glad you brought up the those kind of concepts of the higher lake uh, phosphorus legacy bands being left behind because that is agronomically beneficial for the other crops in your rotation even though soybeans won't really care either way but <laughs> Did the dogs get you, Mara? Yeah, yeah, the dog also is concerned about phosphorus problems. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> Hang on. Okay. Uh, well, well, is, uh, now. But the concept of leaving the phosphorus on the surface is going to be an issue, especially if we're worried about phosphorus loss in spring snowmelt situations. So if we're dealing with that spring snowmelt where it's really that interaction on the surface and if that phosphorus has been broadcast and is on the soil surface, yes, the longer it's had um, to kind of bind up with that soil surface if it's been broadcast earlier in the fall is going to be beneficial, but we still have this strong risk of that uh, snowmelt runoff um and that is potentially going to be a higher risk if we're broadcasting high rates of phosphorus on the surface so if we can band it it's going to be beneficial in the long run in terms of environmental placement as well as that agronomic placement for the other crops in the rotation okay thanks guys uh the next one uh would go to ann kirk uh and it's uh, when producer was getting close to pre-harvest and he was just wondering about staging. Uh, he kind of might be having problems getting at on right now. So I'm gonna ask Lori if uh, we have her. No, I, I just can't find her. <laughs> right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, uh, put up a few uh, pictures here. Uh, there's always lots of talk about the uh, thumbnail test on the wheat, uh, you know, shell out some, uh, some of the head, uh, do the thumbnail test. Uh, if it leaves an impression, uh, that's uh, about the right stage to be at uh, for doing your pre-harvest. Uh, that's usually, you know, anywhere between that 25 and 30% moisture rate uh, where you'd be looking at doing it. Uh, the other is uh, some talk has always been about the, the peduncle, which is just be uh, below the head. Uh, and once that has changed color, uh, then uh, you know that uh, you're uh, basically the nutrients to the head have stopped and uh, the, we're just waiting for the head to ripen up. And in that case, uh, it would be uh, fairly close to being ready to spray as well. So, um, uh, and I guess one other one would be uh, if you're, if you, uh, went back to old school and felt that uh, it was ready to swath. If it was ready to swath, it's usually ready uh, ready to spray for pre-harvest. So uh, uh, a couple things to uh, to look at there when you go out to the field, uh, everything from the thumbnail test to the swathing. So that should uh, get that one. I'm just looking at our time. We're about uh, 10 o'clock. I'm going to go to our seasonal reports uh, and also um, I'm going to in include uh, either in our uh, webinar today but also are in uh, John's uh, Gavlosky's and the 
uh, John Hurd's report uh, that comes out weekly. Uh, I'm going to get a few more places where you could send samples to test for uh, uh, weed resistance. Uh, Ingrid was able to find a couple other places and sent me that, so we'll include that there. Uh, our farm production extension people, uh, Ingrid was on today, so as you can see, a lot of people that could give you a lot of good information and, uh, and help you out in finding out things, so definitely uh, give these people a call. And uh, join us next week, uh, August the 12th. And I'm sure we're going to be into uh, some pretty good harvest by then. I see guys spraying peas. Some some pea harvest has happened. Uh, there'll be winter wheat, fall rye. And, and I think we'll be getting closer to a lot of pre-harvest in a lot of areas. So uh, thanks again for joining. Uh, thanks for the presenters. And see you next week, August the 12th.